Regan, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. President Trump celebrating what he's calling incredible economic growth after a big boost in GDP. The economy growing by 4.1 percent in the second quarter. That's the fastest fastest expansion, excuse me, nearly in four years. I'm just like so overwhelmed. The president <laughs> touting the increase as sustainable and saying more good news is going to come. We're on track to hit the highest annual average growth rate in over 13 years. We're going to go a lot higher than these numbers, and these are great numbers. When I meet the leaders of countries, the first thing they say invariably is, Mr. President, so nice to meet you. Congratulations on your economy. You're leading the entire world. America is being respected again, and America is winning again because we are finally putting America first. Everywhere we look, we are seeing the effects of the American economic miracle. All right, Jesse. So one of the things about this is that we had 4.1 percent growth back in 2014. Doug Holtz-Eakin, a former CBO guy, um, was on the two o'clock show today and said the difference this time is that the economy was growing in all the right ways. And so he does think it is quite sustainable. Yeah, and so does the president. And uh, that's what all his advisors had told him. I mean, the Trump economy is so good, Obama's trying to take credit for it at this point. Remember, they said that Trump was going to crash the markets, and is now it, the economy is the comedy hour or the five? <laughs> well, I'm funny, but also right. <laughs> but remember, they said Trump was going to crash the economy, and now it's doing well, so they want credit. You just pick one, Obama. I mean, Obama mocked. President Trump for saying he could get to 4%, and now he's there, and all the naysayers are saying, oh, well, now it's not sustainable, the same people that said it wasn't possible. And he's done this through tax cuts, deregulation, and energy production. But let's just compare under Barack Obama. I think the final year under Obama, it was 1.5%. He never hit annually 3% GDP, and Trump's on pace to beat that right now. And I think under Obama, they lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs over eight years. Trump has already added nearly 4,000 manufacturing jobs. These numbers are terrific. Consumer confidence is up. Wages are up a little bit. They could be higher. Uh, Four million jobs almost uh, created since his inauguration. So good news all around. If he can just stay strong on the economy, focus on law and order, get these judges in and get some trade wins before the midterms, he'll be able to get his approval rating up to the high 40s, which is going to be really helpful. important going into it November. certainly be helpful. The other thing, Trish, I wanted to ask you about is the personal savings rate was actually a lot higher than economists thought. And that that's good news for the health of the country overall, right? Certainly. I mean, that said, I, I would just say that you do want people to be out there spending. spending. And I do think that people are more confident right now. You mentioned consumer confidence, consumer sentiment. We're seeing, uh, I think, an optimism in this country that we haven't seen in nearly a decade. And, and I, I can say that by the measurement uh, in terms of what we're looking at with unemployment numbers and the jobs added. I can tell you that, that CEOs that I talk to on a regular basis are much more excited and optimistic about the future. There was so much uncertainty that I think overhung that Obama administration. The other thing I'd point out, you saw the president today and how excited he was and how he said, we can sustain this and 4.1%, it's great, we're the envy of the world. Do you notice every time we got a glimmer of hope in the economy during the Obama years, he was never willing to say that. He always had to pedal back and say, well, you know, it's not enough, we're not totally there. This is a president who recognizes the importance of the psychology of the American consumer. Confidence matters. Yeah, I recall, I've called him the head coach of capitalism uh, here. <laughs> the other thing, Greg, is that the economy benefited from the tax cuts, but the thing that doesn't get a lot of attention is how he just basically took the reins off of the regulatory piece. So the, President Obama tried to jam a lot through, and companies now that are having just a sigh of relief that they don't have all of those extra stuff to worry about. How you all have been fooled. Okay. Clearly, this is all a distraction from scandal. <laughs> he created this booming economy, this low <laughs> unemployment, peace with North, Car North Korea. I always say and North Carolina. Carolina. And North Carolina. Carolina. <laughs> Trade, deregulation, judges. He's doing all this to deflect from scandal. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And I hope MSNBC follows that, uh, that path. Uh, Trish, though, is, is absolutely right. People don't understand the power of persuasion. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 these are and I hate to quote Scott Adams are so, drink the drink <laughs> these were always psychological problems and they and it's like if you can actually get uh, affect optimism optimism ends up being the engine that creates productivity and this is something that you know uh, president obama well most most people don't understand but salesmen probably do because they live and die by optimism and confidence uh, what was your question well, i was just saying that it wasn't just the tax cuts that there was yes. the whole deregulation thing. deregulation basically loose, allowed the horses to leave the barn as i uh, to coin a phrase uh, but i will go back to this for the never trumpers and the people that don't like uh, donald trump America, you know, we, we have a choice and it's like, and I've used the metaphor of the doctor, a guy who's got a, l a lousy personality, but great with a knife or a guy you can like who's terrible on a patient. I think the media keeps focusing on the doctor and not the patient. And the patient is America, and it's doing great. You know, don't you yeah, think? Good thank very you very persuasive. much. I think Scott Adams will be very proud of that one if he's watching. You know, he's hosting me on a on a book tour. Well, that's a fantastic thing. Yes, now we got to give Juan there. some time to talk here because <laughs> is it hard for Democrats to figure out a way to run against Trump on the economy with numbers like this? Uh, no, but first <laughs> let me just say that I think it's great news for the country. So the the thing about it is that. The salesman part is exactly, Dana, what opens Trump to critics because people will say, uh, you mean you, you're taking credit for everything? I thought we just had a record number of quarters of sustained growth coming out of what people, I think, across the aisle call the Great Recession and that it was a tremendous recovery mostly under President Obama. Worst Obama had... since World War II. Mo please, are you kidding me? No, well, no, no it's, not kidding it's you. the slowest I'm telling because... You the truth. No, no, but that, that analysis requires you to imagine that somehow, oh, we could have come out faster out of this great recession. Yeah, yes, we could you, have. And I don't think that... Economically speaking, historically speaking, every time you have had a recession, you do actually spring back, and usually the numbers this, look considerably you, better. It yeah, but you don't understand that this that was, was so the confusing. worst recession, Tris. This is the worst recession. This is the worst the country had been since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So what we have now is a situation where things are going, I say, you know, full guns, big boom, whatever. We've got a trillion do $20 trillion economy. We've got near full, un full employment. And so the question is how much growth? So the, today the president's emphasis was on this is going to be sustained. But what you hear from the economists is that, hey, you know what? Part of this is that people were worried about the trade wars. And so a lot of, for yeah. example, well, Chinese buying soybeans was pushed way ahead yeah. in this quarter. What you get is a situation where wages still lagging. These, no, are, these are these are reality. Three They're not things lagging disjointed <laughs> together. You made a list of things because the news is so good. If you step outside the snow globe of, say, like CNN, which only focuses on porn, sto porn stars and lawyers, you realize <laughs> we're on the verge of a pretty awesome age. I would yeah. hope so, but I'm just telling you that if you look at the reality, Can I, okay. we passed tax cuts, or the president put in place tax cuts. That we saw this week are driving deficits at a oh higher goodness. rate. How is it that liberals ever? have suddenly become fiscal conservatives? No, Tell I'm just telling you. No, you I can mean, try to change listen, the topic, you, but you, sometimes you got to spend a little news. to get a little, right? You got to spend a little I mean, to well, get a little. And, and, well, and, we have a lot, and so I do think it's not, it's worth asking. Then what are we going to do about spending? You in need the, future? the growth. But I want to play this because um, here's a possible solution for Democrats. If you follow her lead, watch. If people pay their fair share. If corporations and the ultra wealthy, for example, as Warren Buffett likes to say, if he paid as much as his secretary paid, if we reversed the, the tax bill but went, raised our, our corporate tax rate to 28%, which is not even as high as it was before, right. um, if, we, if we do those two things and also close some of those loopholes, that's $2 trillion right there. If we implement a carbon tax, that's an additional amount of um, of, of a large amount of revenue that we can have. Just last year, we gave the military a $700 billion uh, tax, uh, budget increase, which they didn't even ask for. What we need to do is reprioritize what we want to accomplish as a nation. That Jesse? <laughs> I heard today that she actually has an economics degree. <laughs> and that's just astounding because it didn't look like someone who was versed in economics talking about that. She was looking at her notes the whole time. Hey, talking about how what's <laughs> wrong with that? Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you speak like a, like a linguist, though. I mean, she's oh, just you. trying to keep it simple for the folks. You're going way over their head. <laughs> um, 
I, I think what she's saying is, you know, we can pay for free health care if we do this and they do this and we do this. And if we do this, it's going to raise two trillion. Well, guess what? Guess what? It's going to cost 30 trillion for free health care. So she's not even close to paying for it. I mean, I do think she's a nice person and she means well, but I, I don't think she knows anything about economics. And, you know, I'm impressed that but she's asked about she it. Didn't she answer the question? I don't think she did. Think How she, are you going to pay for it? Well, what she said quite clearly was you guys instead prioritize tax cuts to the point that you'll drive up the deficit. And then, you know, Trisha over here says to me, all of a sudden, liberals care about deficit. Well, I'm just telling you, the deficit doesn't pay for it. Well, I'm just saying, if you said it's more important to, for us as an American people to take care of those who are ill, who've had pre-existing conditions, than to put more money in the pocket of the rich. Juan, mm. it's like someone saying, you know, how are you going to pay for this BMW? And she goes, oh, here's $500. I mean, a BMW costs at least 35 grand. Well, I'm telling you right now, you can have added money if you were to say, you know what, here is our priority. We want to take care of people who are okay. ill. Well, maybe in our she America. just said if we had an investment. All right. Greg's got the last word. All right, all right. Here's the issue nothing that she says uh, pertains to wealth creation. This right. is always the difference between the left and the right. right. Her answer, her solution for any kind of monetary issue or, or gum disease is taxes. Yeah, it's it's going to be wealth. taxes. Uh, but if you ask them, how do you create money? How do you create wealth? They will look at you and they will look down at their notes and there'll be nothing in those notes. They should start asking her how to create wealth instead yeah. of how to take wealth. Yeah. You know I think she would say what we need to do is just redistribute what we have. That's what right. she yeah. said. That's, but that, that's, that's what's that. fun. That's alarming. I mean, that, that, that people fundamentally, I don't think most Americans, if you push them, will actually tell you that they want to go to work and turn over their check to Uncle Sam. I think most Americans really want to keep all that they have. But there is a, a part of the population, you think about the people that followed Sanders or the people that are following her, that say, no, wealth redistribution is okay. Yeah. That's the way they want to live. Because All right, we, so we got to go because we've got so much good stuff well, let me coming. Just make one last point. We, no. have, we have too much <laughs> income inequality, and it's becoming a political liability for, for you guys. Growth, growth, growth. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. A major twist in the Russia investigation regarding the Trump Tower meeting and what are Robert Mueller and Donald Trump Jr. doing next to each other at the airport? The answer ahead. President Trump firing back at his former attorney, Michael Cohen, after Cohen claimed Trump knew about the 2016 Trump Tower meeting. Reports say Cohen is willing to tell special counsel Robert Mueller about what he allegedly knows. But sources say he doesn't have evidence, such as recordings, to back himself up. The president strongly denies knowing about the meeting beforehand and is attacking Cohen's lawyer, longtime Clinton confidant, Lanny Davis. Rudy Giuliani taking the pushback against Cohen even one step farther. The man is a liar, a proven liar. There's no way you're going to bring down the president of the United States on the testimony uncorroborated of a proven liar. And I, I, I guarantee you, this guy is a proven liar. I hear what you're a saying. A year ago, I when I wasn't his saying. lawyer, people in your profession told me this guy will flip because he is an inherent pathological liar. Well, no doubt about that. Huh? And talk about an awkward running. What about this? Mueller and Donald Trump Jr. spotted just a few feet away from each other, waiting at the same gate at an airport in Washington earlier today. It's surrounded by circles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're an astute observer. I've always thought that. I've often thought that. So, Jesse, what do you make of this? Because Giuliani, for the longest time, was, you know, oh, Cohen's a great guy, buddy, but it looks like, hey, suddenly Team Trump, doesn't like Cohen. Well, Cohen's a wounded animal, and he'll say and do anything to save his hide. I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. At worst, it's a he said, she said, or he said, he said. Um, but let's say it's true, and maybe Trump did have a, an inkling of, uh, of warning about the meeting or okayed it or whatever. All right, so it doesn't make him criminally liable for anything. It uh, doesn't put him in any legal jeopardy, I don't think. He lied to the media 
I mean, if, if you lock up anybody that lies to the media, then all the presidents would be in jail. So I don't know if it really moves the needle that much in terms of the investigation. What was the meeting? Remember, it was, hey, I have dirt on Russia. Oh, you do? What do you got? I actually have nothing. Poof, that's it. No money changed hands, no dirt changed hands. When you look at what Hillary did, she actually paid for dirt from Russia. So there is a little bit of difference. I look at this in the context of all these great things happening with the economy, in North Korea, and everything going on in this country. As good as things are over here, you just keep on having these bad and these negative and distracting things over here with the investigations and the personal stuff. So it's just really hard for, I think, the rest of the country to, to understand it. Can you whistle? Because you're whistling past the graveyard here, brother. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Who died, Ron? <laughs> I don't know, you? but I, I would think that it's not a good sign, Dana, that you get Michael Cohen looking like he might want to cooperate. I don't know. Look, I, I don't think Cohen's going to have a lot of defenders. If you were ever on the receiving end of one of his tirades as he was the henchman for all things President Trump before he was president, yeah. like... You don't have a lot of love lost for that guy, believe me. And so, also, he makes lawyers look really bad, like if that could, if, if their reputations could get any worse. I'm going to say something, though, that I think might be true. Right, so it is weird that Michael Cohen decides to hire Lanny Davis. And then Lanny Davis is out there uh, you know, fighting with Rudy Giuliani and giving him a good fight out there in the cable news wars. But because if they're going to drip this out every single day, it will just condition people to be like what Jesse just did. It was like, well, it's not that big a deal because it's just a lie to the media. And it's, well, even then, like, it's not that bad. And if, if this all comes out and it turns out that all the accusations were true, by that point, it's people higher. will be like, oh, well, we don't care because that's exactly what happened to Bill Clinton. Oh, that's interesting. So, Trish, in, in addition to this, then you have Trump's corporate lawyer mm -hmm. being subpoenaed in New York in the Southern District. What does that mean? Well, it's, is there any financial wrongdoing? That's what they're trying to look at as well. I mean, were campaign funds used? Uh, were nefarious people lending him money, et cetera? You know, I, I have a theory on this um, in that Vladimir Putin wanted very badly to mess with us. He wanted to undermine us. He wanted to undermine our government, our democracy, and our faith in our government. And if you think about where we are right now with all the conversations that we keep having about Russia collusion, he has been successful. So to a certain extent, it may not have even mattered to him as long as he could plant these seeds of doubt. And what did he do? He used our greatest strength, which is the openness of our society, the ability um, to I exchange ideas and, and uh, criticize the other sides. He's used all that effectively against us. I mean, it, I spoke with one former intelligence officer today who said, look, trust me, the Russians, if they were really up to something, they're not parading the Russian attorney right into Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue with everybody looking. They would have been uh, a little cagier, a little smarter about it. So it, his feeling was, you know, these are a bunch of breadcrumbs and the media is out there picking up every single one and it could have happened on either side. All I know is it's undermining our well, faith in our system. I think it's a solid point. Gregor? Uh, I think we should replace Shark Week with Lawyer Week, Dana. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay. This, is, this scandal is just a distraction from all the good news about the economy. <laughs> I just thought I'd reverse my other talking point. Look, uh, um, there's so many... There are no rules about going looking for dirt if you're not a politician. It's like if, if somebody said to me, hey, I got dirt on Jesse. It's like, I don't care if you're Russian or Canadian and you know, like we're competing. for. I'm just going to say, yeah, check it. This is about a meeting the president didn't even go to. Mm -hmm. Nobody. It, uh, three words. I don't care. All right. <laughs> the meeting. You took a meeting. You, the meeting meant nothing. I don't care. Trump was there. Trump wasn't there. He wasn't there. I don't care. It, it, was it unseemly? Was it untoward? I don't care. No one cares about this except the people in the snow globe at CNN and MSNBC. Everybody else doesn't care. You've got you got trade. You got North Korea. Well done. Thank you very much. You got uh, GDP. You got the judges. You got unemployment non existent. I don't care if there was this weird meeting with this weird person about something that never happened that the president wasn't at that they asked him about. And he said, yeah, sure. Check it out. Because he's like, you know, he's not, he's not even, he probably wasn't even listening. Yeah, go check it out. I'll see what happens. Give me a Coke. Yeah. I'll see what happens. All right. So if it's illegal, what?
Okay. I don't care. It's the interview everyone's <laughs> talking about. Roseanne Barr opening up about the racist tweet that cost her her career. That's next on The Five. Yeah, this is not... Bar returns to national television for the first time after being fired by ABC to address her racially charged tweet about Valerie Jarrett. The comedian sitting down with Sean Hannity last night. They were saying it was racial when it's political. And then uh, everybody started saying I was a racist. But I have apologized and um, explained and uh, ask for forgiveness. I made a mistake, and I've paid the price for it. I wish I had worded it better, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna let them tell me what I meant. I'm not a racist, and the people who voted for Trump, they're not racist either, and Trump isn't a racist, sorry. When things are going too far right, I'm gonna go a little left, and when things are going too far left, I'm gonna go a little right. I like the middle opinion that balances two extremes. Most people in America, I think, think like that. She's just right down the middle, middle of the fairway. I don't know, do you think that she helped herself at all? Or maybe ABC's going to forgive her after this one, Greg? Um, I don't know. The, the thing is, I like, I, I'm more interested in the whole idea of banishment that we're going through right now. Comedians are odd ducks. They take risks. That was a terrible, obviously a terrible tweet. It was a risk she took. But these ritual crucifixion crucifixions that uh, occur in this town square of social media. That's what bothers me now is that I'm watching. It's like we all imitate each other in a very terrible way on social media. And then to cleanse ourselves, we eject somebody from the town square. And it used to be once every three months, but now it's almost like once every three days. Yeah, terrible tweet. Uh, she's not running for office. Uh, but we, have, we seem to take a lot of pleasure in banishing people. That's the thing. Do, the Do you thing think they have I, reacted? Well, the only thing I would say is that... I, she was looking at this conspiracy-minded website. And if you do that, you go down some terrible roads, and it gives things in your head that then True. if you don't go on Twitter, you might say, and the best advice is just to stay off of those websites altogether. Yeah, for sure. Um, did ABC then do the right thing? Juan saying, okay, you're done, you're out, yeah. we're going to do a spinoff. Well, I think, I think it, especially at this moment when you have such high levels of racial tension in the country, I think that what she did crossed the line. So I was curious, you know, I think this was sort of must see TV. Here's, you know, here she sure. are uh, with Sean. And I thought Sean was pretty strong and very, being very clear with her. Explain me what you did. And she comes back and she says, I wish I had worded it better. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, worded it better. That was a thought in your brain. That's the thought. It's the sentiment that I think people are concerned about. And I think that's why ABC yeah. felt they had to go. Then she says, Oh, you know what? This happened just because I voted for Trump. And I thought, hey, wait a second. They gave you the show. They put the show on and the show was a success. You came right. along and you undermined yourself. So and the other thing I would say, Trish, mm -hmm. is I must say I wondered about her health uh, watching that show. It just I don't know if she's OK. In what way? It just seemed like she was not stable. I didn't, I didn't, I just hope she's okay. You know, Jesse, I think one of the things that perplexes a lot of people, though, is that ABC, for example, came down so hard on her, but then you look at other comedians out there. Samantha Bee comes to mind, who said some pretty, um, pretty disgusting stuff herself, and, and, and that doesn't seem to resonate in as big a way. Why is it that conservatives uh, get hit a little bit harder? I think B was different because she was kind of a B-list celebrity on a cable station, and that was the expectation that she was a nasty person. This is a mainstream, commercially successful hit show, hit reboot on ABC and network television. So the advertisers were going to leave no matter what they did, and people were going to protest with their remotes. I think she looks great as a blonde. <laughs> uh, and, and, and all I have to say is I don't know if I totally believe her apology. But I think she thinks she's sincere. She believes she's sincere. She's got a lot going on upstairs, mm -hmm. it looks like. Yeah, a lot. So there's part two. There's more. There's, there's more, more to come. Day. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you tune in. Don't go anywhere. The Fastest 7 is next. Using Ebates, I... Welcome back. Time for... 
Let's see. Oh, that's the fastest seven. First up, does this ring a bell? Growing up, I remember my parents having one just like this. Great acting. But in the age of iPhones, watch these clueless teens fail while trying to use one of these old school devices. Five, one, two, three, four, five. No. Four, what? Do I have to let it go back every time? Well, if I did that, I'd just call mom. You didn't do it, right? <laughs> See this? Remember that, Greg? You yeah. grew up like that, oh, right? Yeah. You, you know, the, rotary, the worst thing about a rotary phone was that if you had a big family, you could feed a small child with all the food that was in, <laughs> that was inside the little finger holes. Like the, the, it just it just collected so much grease and crumbs <laughs> and true. bacon fat, and like it was always in the kitchen. Oh, it was a food magnet. But you know what? It feels so good on your ear. Put it that. on your no, ear. I love that. You know what I think is wrong with teens nice? today? They're not watching any old movies. So right? There's a this. lot of great old movies where you could learn more about things like <laughs> rotary phones and Walkmans. You look like you're, you work at a call center doing what was, that. What was the thing, the shared line or what everybody... Party line. Party, party line. line. You guys remember the party line? Put this up to your ear, Juan. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I feel like the president, Mr. President, the red phone. <laughs> the red Pick phone. The red, red phone. phone. Right? Yeah. That would be something. So, so let's guess what? I went out to lunch today with one of our college associates. Yep. Lynn Jordell Martin and I. Lynn runs the uh, Fox Opinion page. And so she said to her, young lady, do you know what a mimeograph machine is? And she had no clue. Wait. She A mimeograph? You don't, you don't even know what a mimeograph machine is? No, I don't even know how to say that. Hey, help him out, Trish. Come on, Trish. What's a mimeograph machine? It's, a zero, it's what you called it before, Xerox. Oh, Xerox. Here you go. I think this is so for you. I have some good news. Jesse, since you like this so much, apparently you can buy these. Just, yeah, just the receiver, hard. right? And the, and you just hook it into your cell phone so oh, you I can like walk that. around town and enjoy yeah. uh, but they, this nicely you look at old movies or old phone. great TV shows that they use these phones. Yeah, dial M for murder. That's right. Go. Yeah, Humphrey Bogart. I'm hanging up on that set. <laughs> <laughs> Next, don't mess with the Queen's Guard or else. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Looks harsh, but the woman's okay. Some reports say the incident may have been set up by the tourists at Windsor Castle to try to provoke the soldier. The British Ministry of Defense isn't showing sympathy either, saying the ropes are there to protect both the public and our soldiers. Please stay behind them. Greg, were you one of those guys that went up to the guards that were like this and just tried to distract them? No, 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 no. You don't mess with the guard. He's called a guard. By the way, that's exactly me when I'm boarding the plane and somebody from a, from a group, like Group C, Get is, is getting in front of Group A. I'll just go like, Get out your Group C! <laughs> <laughs> there, there is protocol you have to follow when you go over across the pond, right? No, they're very, very um, traditional, yes. and I like that. I like that very much. One time, I remember uh, I was on the phone, and the president was giving a speech somewhere, and I was in the staff room, and then all of a sudden, I see everybody's getting ready to go, and he moved so fast, I thought I was going to miss the motorcade, so I tried to go out the door, and all of a sudden, it went boom, right back in my face, because it wasn't the proper door, and it was... They even thought it was a threat. So I almost like lost my hand. Dana was so you a threat. Have to, you know, follow the rules. You would yes. be the least threatening person to charge anybody. <laughs> Go ahead, Juan. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious because I was reading about this, Jesse, and it said that the Chinese have gone crazy about this. Why? I don't know. I don't because it's, it's something about she's, order and, and, and well, rule of law. Was, is the woman Asian? I don't know. I, I can't remember. I don't. But so, I, don't. It, I think the Chinese liked it just because it was on their social media and they've uh, got like mm. gazillions of people. Yeah, gazillions. But anyway, it seems to me it's pretty obvious about the rules here, although I think you shouldn't treat tourists badly. I mean, it's not like she was really a threat. Well, I don't know. If, was he kicking her or was he that just was continuing aggressive. to move? It, it, it looked kind of like a push. Was it a push? Right? Like, I mean, like, she kind of... Uh, like, we got Sports Center. We need to get Corey Lewandowski in here. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe it was. Hey, hey, hey. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Finally, forget about holding the mayo. An ice cream parlor in Scotland is churning stomachs on social media with this new creation. Mayonnaise-flavored yeah. ice cream. Come on. One person writing, I'm going to report this page for hate content. How dare you desecrate the honor of ice cream with this monstrosity. Ew, no. Here's another. The purpose of mayo ice cream isn't for enjoyment. It's tricking your friends into thinking it's vanilla. That's good. But the scoop shop insists it's not as gross as it sounds. The owner claims his frozen treat is, quote, a full-on hit of fat and cream followed with an eggy, milky 
after taste. Well, that's a great way to describe uh, it. You might want to check the marketing on that. <laughs> yeah, there was another know. one that was buffalo wing ice cream. I got to say, I might try that. I'd try that. Would you? Well, I love this. I'm a very, as you know, I'm a very, very busy guy. I got a lot of things going on in my life. And I love mayonnaise and I love ice cream. Here's an opportunity to have both at the same time. It cuts my eating habits in half. I've, I've, I've saved over, like, say, 20 minutes of time every day because I just eat this. Combine dinner yeah. and dessert. And the calories are amazing. It's high fat. It's delicious. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, it says here that the number one most unusual is something called ghost pepper peppermint. Oof. In Bellingham, Washington, and I think the idea of hot and sweet, I'm not sure it quite works, but here's the Hang one. Out with me. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> but this one that really made me nuts was this one dill pickle flavored ice cream in Stanley, North Dakota. I thought, boy, when my wife was pregnant, they would have sold out of that stuff. <laughs> um, I just make it a habit to never eat mayonnaise or ketchup or mustard really? or rel no condiments, no condiments -condiment? only salt. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> what? Ever kid? since I was a little kid, yeah. Wow. So what I'm going to yeah. do now is I'm going to give you vanilla, and in fact, it's mayonnaise. Perks <laughs> on you. Stay right there. Fan Mail Friday, up next. Fan Mail Friday, it's finally here. Let's get to it. Oh, great question from Melanie. Sounds like the plot to a movie, though. If your five-year-old self suddenly found themselves inhabiting your current body, so you're five years old, but you now, what would your five-year-old self do first? Jesse. Drive. Um, <laughs> drive. It's probably just drive dangerously. What am I supposed to do? I mean, you're five. I'm five. You're what did I like at five? <laughs> Let's see. Besides that. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Right. Yes, Dana. Michael Jackson. Well, when I was five, my mom gave me a kitchen perm. Oh, yeah. And it's in my, like, you know, the little pictures that you got yeah, at yeah. school and the little things. It is the worst hair mm. thing you've ever seen. So that my five-year-old self would be quite happy in this new hairstyle. Ah. So you'd like you'd stare at the you would stare in the mirror and go, I'm so pretty. <laughs> I'm in, I can't wait to be an adult. I'll be so pretty. <laughs> and I will never get a kitchen perm. Uh, but Trish. I mean, mom, I love you and everything, but so that I'm was really bad. I'm gonna continue on that uh, yes. that vein. Um, makeup. I loved makeup. I used to go into my mother's dressing area and Me get too. all <laughs> get <laughs> lipstick out, and you know it'd be like all over my face, and I'd get in trouble. Yeah. And then I'd go and I'd do it again. Yeah. And I'd get in trouble and I'd do it again. So one of my little girls recently went in and grabbed oh. the pink lipstick. It was all over her face. It happened to be waterproof. Waterproof. Wow. Wow. So I found her trying to get it off and I just laughed my head off. And I said, that's exactly what I would have done. There you go. So that's there you go. good. What about you, Juan? Would you apply makeup? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know how you got into her mother's boudoir, but that was good, Greg. That was good. Uh, I, I happen to know two five-year-old people. They're going to have a birthday coming up this mm -hmm. weekend, so they'll soon be six. But anyway, I think the answer to this question is I'd stay up late. No one could tell me when to go to sleep. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a very good one. Of course, one. I would have a lot of bazooka bubble gum in addition to staying up. Mm. Yeah. I would beat up Mark Johnson. Okay. Yeah, because I'm five and Mark is seven. And he's just, oh, when I walked, walked home through Hidden Park in San Mateo, it would always give me grief. But I think I could take him now. So I'd come back, I'd beat the crap out of him. And everybody in the neighborhood would go, who's that mystery man who looks like little Greg Gutfeld? Anyway, question from Donna writes, what is the weirdest thing a guest has done at your house? Oh, I got one. I got one. Oh, all right. Oh, all right. Dana? It has to do with Jesse. Oh, yes. <laughs> so at the, ah. at, we had a five party at our house, and Jesse got to stay. Um, the, he was staying over. You guys stayed yeah. over. You and Elena stayed over. And he was in the top floor, and it, our house was pretty new. And it was a pull-out couch. So oh, he, he left the bar early, and he went home. And the next morning, he had to leave early. So my sister and I, later on in the day, were, cleaning, were really straightening things up, putting the house back together. And I go upstairs, and she says, I said, huh. She says, is everything okay? I'm like, well, the couch is put back together, but the mattress is up against the wall. Mm. <laughs> and, I, don't why, why? I don't know why he did that. Why I think did it's I do the that? weirdest thing. I think you <laughs> never you slept, slept in a fold out. On? No, wait a second. I think I was trying to put the bed back together and make the bed as a good house guest would do. 
But you took but, the bed out of the couch and put it against the wall. Was it a pull-out couch? Yes. Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, you destroyed the whole thing. Oh. Yeah, the, yeah, the, no, that's Trish. Ah, can I punt? No, I'm new to this. Can no I punt? punt? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think I have anything really good. I mean, a, a few overserved, right? Yeah. People falling asleep in their plate, but I think that happens to everyone. <laughs> I don't have anything that can compare with Jesse putting the mattress up against the wall. Yes. That's good. Yeah. What about you, Jesse? I mean, I'm usually the one that's doing weird stuff at someone else's <laughs> house. Um, no one has, I don't know if anybody's done. I mean, my mother has come over and yelled at me and called me horrible <laughs> names, and I've had to, like, kick her out a little bit. But that's, that's just par for the course. That's not true. Why? I think the weirdest thing is, you know, you hear noise in the middle of the night. You think, what the? What? And then you go downstairs, the people are downstairs up, eating, watching TV. And you think, what are you? What is going on here? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, what is that sour milk? Yeah. You know, suddenly you, like, you go in the fridge to get some milk, and you're like, hey, this ain't milk. Somebody put this in here. What is this? That's mayonnaise. I don't have time to get into the stain, but I had a guy had a I had a guest come and stay, and they left, and they there was a massive stain in the in the second bedroom that was like the size of like a table, and I'll never to this day know what it was. Sorry about that. I'll never. Yes, <laughs> you should have just brought your medication. All right, Edward says, "What is your?" Uh, CD player, tape deck, or your turntable right now? What's in it? Mm -hmm. What did you, meaning what did you play last? Uh, All right, well, let me go to Juan, because I haven't gotten to him first. I don't, I don't know what I last played. I guess I, 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 lately I've been into chill music, but I'm listening to XM to get chill. Oh, all right. Yeah. Interesting, Trish. Uh, I have a really eclectic mm -hmm. taste in music, so <clears throat> we're talking everything from country to opera mm -hmm. to pop mm -hmm. to Irish. Yeah. Folk music. Oh, really? Yeah, Irish folk yeah, music. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go. That's good. <laughs> Fun to drink to, Jesse. Jesse, I guess it's Maroon 5, isn't it, for um, you? Close. Cardi B. Cardi B. I have Cardi B, and that's uh, top 50. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. I know what I, you're going to say. No. You okay, don't. Go, I don't. It's a new uh, artist that I was introduced to last weekend. Her name is Maggie Rogers, oh. and she has a new song out today called Give a Little, and I knew it was coming out today, so I listened to it. It's very good. Excellent. Excellent. I can't remember what I had in my. I think I was Polka. Polka. No, Scottie no, it was a, a band called ARP. A R P, not A A R P, because yeah, that would right. be very good. A R P. You're listening to the A A R P channel. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's amazing. <laughs> it's all the classic rock. All right, I get it. One more thing. Up next. Jeez. So you have. Fan Mail Friday, it's finally here. Let's get to it. Oh, great question from Melanie. Sounds like the plot to a movie, though. If your five-year-old self suddenly found themselves inhabiting your current body, so you're five years old, but you now, what would your five-year-old self do first? Jesse. Drive. Um, <laughs> drive. <laughs> probably just drive dangerously. What am I supposed to do? I mean, you're five. five. You're what did I like at five? <laughs> Let's see. Besides that. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yes, Dana? Michael Jackson. Well, when I was five, my mom gave me a kitchen perm. Oh, yeah. And it's in my, like, you know, the little pictures that you got yeah, at yeah. school and the little things. It is the worst hair mm. thing you've ever seen. So that my five-year-old self would be quite happy in this new hairstyle. Ah, so you'd like, you'd stare at the, you would stare in the mirror and go, I'm so pretty. <laughs> I'm in, I can't wait to be an adult. I'll be so pretty. And I will never get a kitchen perm. Ah, but if I mean, mom, I love you and everything, but so that I'm was really bad. I'm going to continue on that, uh, yes. that vein. Um, makeup. I loved makeup. I used to go into my mother's dressing area and Me get too. all, <laughs> get <her laughs> lipstick out and, you know, it'd be like all over my face and I'd get in trouble. Yeah. And then I'd go and I'd do it again. Yeah. And I'd get in trouble and I'd do it again. So one of my little girls recently went in and grabbed oh. the pink lipstick. It was all over her face. It happened to be waterproof. Waterproof. Wow. Wow. So I found her trying to get it off and I just laughed my head off and I said, that's exactly what I would have done. There, you go. So there you go. That's good. What about you, Juan? Would you apply makeup? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know how you got into her mother's boudoir, but that was good, Greg. That was good. Uh, I, I happen to know two five-year-old people. They have a birthday coming up this mm -hmm. weekend, so they'll soon be six. But anyway, 
I think the answer to this question is I'd stay up late. No one could tell me when to go to sleep. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a very good one. Of course, I would have a lot of bazooka bubble gum in addition to staying up. I would beat up Mark Johnson. Okay. Yeah, because I'm five and Mark is seven. And he's just, oh, when I walked, walked home through Hidden Park in San Mateo, it would always give me grief. But I think I could take him now. So I'd come back, I'd beat the crap out of him. Oh and, 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 everybody in the, money on Mark. and everybody in the neighborhood would go, who's that mystery man who looks like little Greg Gutfeld? <laughs> anyway, question from Donna writes, what is the weirdest thing a guest has done at your house? Oh, I got one. I got one. Oh, all right. Holy smokes. All right. Dana? It has to do with Jesse. Oh, yes. <laughs> so at the, ah. at, we had a five party at our house, and Jesse got to stay. Um, the, he was staying over. You guys stayed yeah. over. You and Elena stayed over. And he was in the top floor, and it, our house was pretty new. And it was a pull-out couch. So oh, he, he left really? the bar early, <laughs> and he went home. And the next morning, he had to leave early. So my sister and I, later on in the day, were, cleaning, were really straightening things up, putting the house back together. And I go upstairs, and she says, I said, huh. She says, is everything okay? I'm like, well, the couch is put back together, but the mattress is up against the wall. Mm. <laughs> and I don't know why he did that. Why I think I it's the that? weirdest thing. I think you never you slept, slept in a fold down. On no, wait a second. I think I was trying to put the bed back together and make the bed as a good house guest would do. But you took but the bed out of the couch and put it against the wall. Was it a pullout couch? Yes. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Dana Perino along with Trish Regan, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City and this is The Five. President Trump celebrating what he's calling incredible economic growth after a big boost in GDP. The economy growing by 4.1% in the second quarter. That's the fastest fastest expansion, excuse me, nearly in four years. I'm just like so overwhelmed. The president <laughs> touting the increase as sustainable and saying more good news is going to come. We're on track to hit the highest annual average growth rate in over 13 years. We're going to go a lot higher than these numbers, and these are great numbers. When I meet the leaders of countries, the first thing they say invariably is, Mr. President, so nice to meet you. Congratulations on your economy. You're leading the entire world. America is being respected again and America is winning again because we are finally putting America first. Everywhere we look, we are seeing the effects of the American economic miracle. All right, Jesse. So one of the things about this is that we had 4.1% growth back in 2014. Doug holtz Eakin, the former CBO guy, um, was on the 2 o'clock show today and said the difference this time is that the economy was growing in all the right ways, and so he does think it is quite sustainable. Yeah, and so does the president, and uh, that's what all his advisors had told him. I mean, the Trump economy is so good, Obama's trying to take credit for it at this point. Remember, they said <laughs> that Trump was going to crash the markets, and is now it, the economy is the comedy is hour.